welcome everybody. Um, my name is Helen Dewey. I'm the Vice President of Medfield Green. Michelle Stahl here is the President of Medfield Green and then Marie Nolan is the Chairperson for the Medfield Energy Committee. So we have worked on putting together these meetings and we thank the library for hosting us. Thank you very much. And we are being um, taped um, for Medfield uh, cable TV. So it will be running on Medfield Cable TV and you don't even have to watch it at a particular time anymore. You can just go on the website and you can view the archive. So if there's something that you missed that you wanted to get more info on or if you have a neighbor or family who were not able to come tonight, certainly they could take a look at it as well. So I'd like to welcome everybody here. Thanks for coming out in the rain. Um, just a few little things with Medfield Green. We do have some upcoming meetings we wanted to let you know about. Our next meeting is going to be April 7th, which is a Sunday, and it's at the Harmony Center in Medfield. And it is, and I keep forgetting the term. It's, um, EMS. EMS, the yeah, Electromagnetic Radiation, radiation Fields. Um, uh, and how they impact your health, like your cell phone, your Wi-Fi, your computer, that sort of thing. Um, so that'll be an interesting talk. And then we have Medfield Green Day, which is on May 4th, Saturday, May 4th. It's held at the Legion, and this will be our fourth annual, and it's kind of like drive in and recycle, reuse, and drop off all your stuff and drive out. Um, so you'll see more of that coming up. Um, and then we also have the Jumpstart meetings. Megan, do you have any um, set dates yet or no? Our next Jumpstart meeting is going to be... April 4th, we're going on a field trip to Harvey Recycling. Oh, okay. And then on the April 11th, we'll have an official meeting here in the library at 1230. Okay, and those, is that a Thursday? It They're is most, Thursday. Okay, so yeah. Thursday at, at around noontime or around, well, the second one's at 1230. Yep, you might okay. want to keep that. Oh, no, no. Okay. So it's the, um, uh, the jump start, which we, uh, Megan kind of started, is just kind of a, a little impromptu, casual meeting of like-minded people here at the library um, just to discuss different issues. So the upcoming meeting is on okay. April 4th. It's going to, I'm just repeating for the mic, <laughs> April 4th, um, to take a um, field trip to go see the Harvey um, Recycling, which is, we do the single stream recycling here in Medfield, and they're going to go check it out and see exactly how that is done. Um, and then the next meeting is going to be on April 11th here at the library. It's usually in this room. Um, so you're aware of that. Okay? 12.30. I think that's it for Medfield. Energy Committee, you want to, do you have any upcoming meetings or anything? Uh, not necessarily for the public, but we're excited about a wastewater treatment plant site visit for looking at the potential of solar at the, at the plant on the property. On the ah. 23rd. With our oh. new uh, director of the wastewater treatment plant, he's arranged to have several mm -hmm. uh, experts come and explain to the to the uh, water and sewer board as well as the Metro Energy Committee uh, the ins and outs of, of how you uh, put together a solar program. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. All right, so now I'll get to my um, speaker, our speaker, I should say. Um, this is Dan Rubin, who's from Newton, so we welcome him. He actually spoke to Medfield Green, um, it was a, a quite a number of years ago, um, about almost this exact thing, but he's really kind of updated it, and um, it was very exciting. Um, he's presently the executive director of Boston Green Tourism. He was previously um, the executive director of the Coalition for Environmentally Responsible conventions. I didn't even know there was such a coalition. So you worked on the, both the Democratic and the Republican National Conventions in 2004 and then yep. 2008 the Democratic National Convention. Well I consulted or, in Denver mm -hmm. uh, on the Democratic mm -hmm. Convention. Wow, so that's, that's, that's really interesting. And then he was also the unsung environmental hero for Massachusetts in 1998. So anyway, he speaks and writes on green hospitality, global warming, and environmentally sustainable lifestyles. So we welcome Dan Rubin. Thank you very much. Okay. When Helen asked me to speak, I decided I would rewrite uh, a presentation that I give a few times a year. And um, the presentation is uh, putting your own house in order, how to live an environmentally friendly lifestyle. And I decided to make it more, uh, more personal and use be greater illustrations in the talk. So your, your handout was the, the presentation that I used to give. When Helen asked me to speak, 
I said the name of my presentation was how to cut your carbon footprint by 85% without changing your lifestyle. So I wrote this up and I showed it to some friends and they said, if I did those things, it would change my lifestyle. So I changed the, I changed the tagline. Um, I think my lifestyle is the same as it was before, but to other people, it, it might not be. Uh, this should be a fun presentation because it's about the way we live. It's about the decisions that we make every day. Um, and when I say presentation, this is, would be most interesting if it's a discussion slash presentation. So where you have questions, comments, input, if you want to challenge me, please speak up. It would, make the, it would make our session more fun and interesting. And when you speak, try to keep it kind of short or I'll, I'll move us along to make sure that we, we reach everything. Uh, next slide. My main work right now is uh, greening hotels, helping hotels reduce energy, water, waste, and toxins. Uh, next slide. When Bob Dylan wrote this verse in 1963, and he said, and admit that the waters around you have grown, he meant it figuratively. But today, we know that that's literal. The waters, the waters around us are growing. Um, the ocean outside of New England, outside of the East Coast, is a foot higher than it was a century ago before global warming started. That foot was the first foot that came on shore during Hurricane Sandy. And it was the highest foot that came on shore during Hurricane Sandy. It contributed mightily to, the, um, to the, the loss of life, to the great economic damage uh, that occurred there. The Boston Harbor Association decided to study, you know, after Hurricane Sandy, they said, well, could this happen here? And what they found was that Hurricane Sandy didn't hit us as hard as it hit New York and New Jersey, but when it hit hardest, it hit at low tide. Had Hurricane Sandy hit at high tide, then 6% of Boston would have been underwater. And we would have suffered the same fate as they did in New Jersey and New York. A loss of life, great economic damage to our downtown and to other areas. As we know, in the three storms that have hit uh, in the last six months, we've lost houses um, along, uh, along our shoreline. Now, I won't go through the litany of what climate change will do. You know much of it. But that's just one area where we are particularly vulnerable. It should focus our minds that we really need to do something to tackle this problem. So one or two slides about the problem before we, we talk about what we could do about it. Climate scientists have a consensus. We need to cut, as a world, we need to cut our carbon footprint by 80% by the year 2050. We, uh, mostly that means we need to reduce our use of fossil fuel and our output of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere by 80% by 2050. And a lot of that change has to happen now. And what we're trying to do is avoid, um, is avoid increasing the temperature on the planet by 2 degrees Celsius or 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. We've already raised it 1.5 degrees and we're seeing what the consequences are. Um, climate science, scientists and others are clear, if we blow past 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, the consequences will be dire. Um, right now, it looks like we're going to blow right past 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. In the U.S., we've got to cut beyond 80 percent because we can't expect poor people of the world to cut their carbon emissions by 80 percent, and the world's population is still growing quickly. Uh, it's supposed to grow another 2 to 4 billion people to somewhere between uh, 9 and 11 billion before it starts leveling off. So to reach this more than 80% figure, everybody has to be involved. We can't say it's just government, just business, just agriculture. Um, it's the consumers also. It's all of us have to participate in the solution or we're going to blow way past 3.6 degrees and suffer dire consequences. Next slide. So most of the things that I'm going to talk about, particularly to a green friendly crowd, you're going to say that's pretty sensible. There might be a couple things that I'll mention that even in this crowd you might say that's crazy. I ain't doing that. <laughs> and you don't necessarily need to do it. But when you think what's crazy, what's more crazy 
I wear six layers of thermals in the wintertime uh, because I, I work mostly from home and I keep my house um, around 58 degrees in the winter. Is that crazy or is it crazier to allow our world to fall apart by not doing what we need to do to cut carbon by 85%? This is my own experience. I, I bought my townhouse in 1995. Um, since then, I've cut my use of carbon by 78%, and soon I'm going to reach 85%. In 1995, I used 1,818 gallons of oil. This much for gasoline, this much for, for, uh, hot, for heating my house, this much for 275 gallons for hot water. For my electricity bill, I converted the kilowatt hours into oil just so I could make this one a uh, nice figure that I could calculate. So I used the equivalent of 63 gallons of oil for my electricity. That was about uh, 200 kilowatts a month. Last year, in 2012, I cut that 1,800, 18 gallons of oil down to 400. I cut down to 160 gallons of gasoline, 240 gallons uh, for heat and, and hot water, and the equivalent of zero gallons for electricity. Um, and I'm going to cut even further in 2013 because I'm going to use a lot less oil for hot water. So this is a talk, a lot of this talk is going to be how I did this. Um, <clears throat> but focusing on what you could do also. Um, an important point, I'm, I'm not a hero here, that's not my point. I drive a car, I live in a townhouse that's uh, 1160 square feet. My point is rather, we could all substantially cut our carbon footprint. Um, if we really think on it and work on it, we could really cut it down and save a lot of money in the process. Um, your circum you'll see a lot of things in this presentation that you're already doing, you could do, um, and then, but, but your strategy will be different than mine because we all live different lives, we all work in different places, we have different homes, different family members, etc. Um, on the handout, and if we have time, we'll get to the handout also. Um, but on the handout, I list uh, more strategies, in, including some of the ones that uh, I don't list here. First, we'll talk about home heating. So as I say, I, I used to use, um, I think, four, I've go, gone from about 450 down to about 175 gallons of heating oil, uh, of oil used to heat my house. Um, this is how I did it. First, and foremost, and, and for each of these sections, I'm going to list them roughly in order of what's the most important. Most importantly, it's important to get energy audits and to use a blower door test and an infrared test where you can. So you'll really see how leaky is your house, how much insulation do you have, where are the gaps both in your, in, 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 you know, where's the air flowing into your home and where's the insulation flowing in. Helen. What's, a, what's blower door? A blower door test is um, the, uh, the auditor will open your door, they'll put in their own door with a powerful fan and they'll blow the air out. And so that negative pressure means that it will pronounce all the places where the air is blowing into your house and be very easy to see. You can even hear the air coming into your house. So it's a way of identifying where are the leaks in your house. My house was built in 1869. There are a lot of leaks. Uh, but that's true of most houses. Most houses are, are very porous, and we have um, um, lots of places where air is streaming in. Um, so I've done some of that air sealing myself, and, I had, and, and once I had a professional job um, doing it, and it was really good to do both. I learned a lot by doing it myself, and there are a lot of things that I got to that the auditors would, didn't get to both before and after the audit. The fireplace damper is a very common place where you lose energy. Um, I once saw this, there was a contest of this, uh, you know, families were competing to reduce their energy use by the most. And the winner of the contest was somebody that didn't, <laughs> that didn't close the damper on their winter, on, on their, in their fireplace the winter before. They realized they needed to close the damper and they cut their energy use by 67%. Um, but even for those of us, I have a big stone over my fireplace opening. I didn't realize it, but it, didn't, it, didn't fit, it doesn't fit well. And so air was just streaming right out of my 
heated home right out the, uh, the fireplace. Now, after I learned that, that, my, that I had a very leaky uh, flue or damper, um, I, I realized not only to make sure it's very tight, but also to insulate it. Because it's like an area of your ceiling that's not insulated. So who insulates the, the, the like the... This table? was, uh, in, in this case, it was Next Step Living. When they oh. did an a, a air sealing job in my house, they did it. Oh, okay. Could we move back? Back at least one? Yeah, there we go. I found that I had my, uh, it, my stove... In back of my stove, there's an opening like this in my, you know, th th that let the stove vent. Well, gosh, that let, just in the wintertime, it let cold air, this much cold air, right in. Same with my dryer. I don't have a dryer, but same, same for the, the dryer vent. So I plugged both of those up. If uh, you use those, make sure, you know, make sure you're not losing a lot of, a lot of air through those, through those places. Make sure they're, they're uh, tight when they're not being used. Bathroom vents, same thing. I had an area around my bathroom vent where the air just went right out my house. Um, doors, doors are notoriously leaky. I put in both door sweeps and weather stripping, and they still leak a little bit. Can I ask a question about the, the, the vent behind your stove? I can we probably have something like that because it is very drafty here, kitchen around there. But what would you plug it up with if it, you're talking about a stove, stove? You don't want something to catch fire. So what kind of material do you use? You know, I don't cook with fish, and so I just don't vent my stove. And so I plugged it up with uh, Next Up Living plugged it up with. Uh, I don't know if they use great stuff or what exactly they plugged it. Something that is, first I put in fiberglass insulation. They said, that's not doing anything because it's porous. Air, air moves through it. So they put a, a non-permeable substance there to plug it up. But it doesn't have to be removed when you use the stove? I don't use my vent. But if you do use your vent, find something that, that um, you know, will, will at least put up a barrier when you're not using it and it'll blow open when you do use the vent. Good question. Um, so doors, doors are crooked, they're warped, um, they, a lot of air. When I, <clears throat> after living in my house for five or 10 years, I don't know, I was down at my front door and I realized it's a, you know, it's a big heavy wooden door. There's a crack this big totally, where air, you know, I could look outside. Winter air just moved in and out. So I put a door sweep on. I even put door sweeps on some, some of my interior doors in my house if there were spaces that I wasn't heating uh, to, to wall them off. And I put one in my bathroom because there's a, a radiator in my bathroom. And when the heat comes on in the morning, it, it keeps the heat inside the bathroom, which is the place I want to be warmest first thing in the morning. And it is. Um, windows leak all over the place. So I used weather stripping, putty, I sealed the air pockets in the winter, and I have a professional, and, and I had a professional window restoration, uh, which wasn't terribly necessary. I don't think it improved the, the air infiltration, but allowed my, in, my windows to, to work well, and now I don't have to take the, the putty on, uh, on and off every uh, spring and every fall. Um, and the, the professional window uh, restoration does have very good weather stripping. It's, it's kind of expensive. Recessed lights, where I have recessed lights that go to the outside, I, I found that they were leaking around the rims, and so I sealed those up. Next slide. You know where, there's the, where you have space, let's say, between, uh, for example, here there's this wall, and then there's the other wall, and there's a space in between. Well, I had a lot of leakage. I plugged up a lot of that area, so I'm not heating any of those interior spaces in my house. Maybe it's 3% of the house. Now I'm no longer heating it. The floor perimeters were very leaky. Anywhere where there's pipe penetrations were leaky. The electric outlets, I put in outlet insulators, and more, and more, and more. This is a job where I never feel it's quite done. I had... I had this done professionally by Next Step Living. And, um, you know, they did a good job. Um, but they didn't, but afterwards I realized there's still plenty of leaks in my house. So let's say you have a house where you have air infiltration that equals 40 cubic feet per minute. 
uh, four, excuse me, 4,000 cubic feet per minute. Uh, next step living might bring that down to 2,500 cubic feet per minute. And when I say next step living, any energy uh, uh, auditor and insulator and, and uh, any en energy professionals. Um, that's wonderful. They walk away thinking they did a great job, and they did do a great job, and they've saved you a lot of money, and, and they've uh, reduced your energy usage. But you might be able to get your energy you know, down uh, a lot more than that. They don't go back and do, after they've done the job, do another blower door test uh, and find out where are the leaks. So it's really important that with air sealing your home, you keep after it. It's almost never done. Um, where I found, you know, the, here it's probably not a problem, but if this was a wood floor and I saw cracks, you could put a white or clear uh, caulking with a caulking gun around the edge. Okay. And um, that works well. Insulation, I could only get at half of my ceiling. So I did the best I could. I, uh, you know, for, for those areas, I greatly increased the amount of uh, insulation. Uh, but obviously, it would be ideal to, to get it your entire ceiling. Um, I had my walls insulated professionally. They blew in uh, foam, ins uh, they blew in um, uh, cellulose insulation. Um, and my basement hot water uh, pipes I insulated. You could just go to the hardware store. So if you have hot pipes in your basement, the heater comes on, uh, you, touch, you touch them in the basement, and they're warm, that means you're heating up your basement. Maybe you use it, and maybe that's okay, but if you're not using your basement, um, you're wasting heat. Uh, that, that heat is just going into the basement where it's not needed and not as much into your living spaces where they are. Dial down in winter. So the, the warmest it is during the day in my house is just before I wake up. So I set my, my uh, programmable thermostat so my house gets up to 61 degrees just before I wake up. As I say, I, um, I, I put a door sweep under, my, uh, under the door of my bathroom. So my bathroom's actually in the 70s. Um, and then the temperature could drift down as low as 56 before I turn the heat back up. Um, at night, it could go down as low as 52. Of course, when guests come, I say, uh, I, I turn up the heat because I have a special outfit that I wear. They don't have the special outfits, but I tell them I'll crank the heat up to 65, dress warmly. So my outfit, I have two pair of socks on and slippers. I have a very heavy flannel pants. I have six layers of thermals, a fleece jacket over that, a light fleece jacket over that, and oftentimes wear a scarf. That might sound crazy, but even a green audience says, yep, he's crazy. Um, but I'm perfectly comfortable. Um, and so I'm comfortable, I'm, I'm, not, I'm polluting a lot less, and my bills are a lot less. So I don't feel it's a sacrifice because I'm not uncomfortable. Um, I am uncomfortable about 1% of the time, and I could live with that. The 1% is usually, it's in the evening, it's 58 degrees, and I've got to change to go out. And so I have to take off my warm clothes, put on lighter clothes, and, and run out of the house. And so. Sometimes I'll do a little exercising so I could warm up uh, before I make that change. But, um, but I view this as really not changing my lifestyle. I change the way I dress. It's a comfortable outfit, and so it's not a sacrifice. If one were to say, um, you know, if one were to look at your children or the young people that you love and say, can I do this for them? Um, is, this, is this something that, that um, you know, if their lives are on the line, would I do this? Of course you do it. You, you, not only would you do it, but you'd get used to it and it would be no big deal. Um, that's, that's the way it is for me. Um, when, I'm gonna go away, when I go away for the weekend, I turn my heat lower. I, you know, I'm mindful of if it's going to go down to 10 degrees, I'm worried about my pipes freezing, I don't turn it so low. If it's only going to go down to 28, then you know, I'll, just, I'll just let my heat drop. Uh, I just won't turn the heat on when I'm away. My, I tune up my oil furnace annually. If you have gas, you need to, to um, do it once every other year. I put in some, um, some very good window insulation. You, I'm sure you've seen it. They're honeycombs. If you use the blackout, it's even better. They're really good. Um, they, they, uh, you notice a big difference. When I walk past my windows, I no longer get this blast of cold air. 
Um, they, need to, they need to hit your sill on the bottom and have a flush and be flush on the bottom. Um, and as I understand it, it's best to have at least a tiny gap. Th those that seal on the sides, you, you, your, air, your window could get so hot that it could crack the window. Um, this was not particularly cost effective. They cost a lot of money. I'm not going to get all of that back in the heat savings, but I'm going to get a, a good portion of it back in, in, the, uh, in, in reduction of my uh, heating bill. I also put aluminum behind my radiators. So I have radiators uh, near the wall. I put aluminum, you know, cardboard with aluminum foil, and so I'm not heating up my walls. So that pushes the heat towards the center of the room where I need it. Uh, not, uh, it doesn't heat up my walls. So those are the way, that, that's how I reduce my uh, uh, heating bills. Yes? Are, are those honeycombed uh, window trays, are those duets? Yes. Um, Hunter Douglas Duet something or other. And um, there may be other companies that make it also. I, I bought Hunter Douglas. Do you know, um, I know you said that turn your, uh, well, maybe it was on here, turn your water heater down to 120 degrees. Um, do you know anything about the tankless water heaters? Do they save energy? I'll get to that in the next section. Okay. All right. But uh, yes, okay. they do. <laughs> um, other, uh, any other questions? Okay, let's go to hot water. Um, so, now you're really going to think I'm crazy. In the spring and summer and fall, so I, I, I heat my home about uh, uh, seven and a half months of year I need heating. So first week of April I no longer need heating until maybe the last week of October. Um, and I have a hot water system, so I, I get, you know, so I, when the heat comes on I have hot water also. The rest of the year I turn off my hot water except for Saturday mornings. So when I, when I want to take a shower, when I want to clean myself, I soap up my head, I put it under the, the faucet, and I hand wash. I hand wash uh, other, other places where I, uh, where I need to wash. Um, that might sound like a great sacrifice, but it's a lot faster. <laughs> um, so most of the year, my system is totally turned off except for Saturday mornings. I take a hot shower, I run my dishwasher. Uh, obviously, if I go to the beach, hand washing isn't going to do. Isn't going to do. So I need to take a hot shower. If I'm in a mucky pond or something, and I want to, you know, so I will turn on hot. I'll, I'll make exceptions and turn on my hot water at other times. But most of the time, my system is shut off, and I'm not using hot water. So I used to use 275 gallons of water a year. Now I use 30. I don't, I, I, there's, there would be no way for, for hot water, there'd be no way that I could get to 85% without doing something substantial with my hot water. Uh, question? I just wanted, do you, are you worried about cracked pipes or anything? There's pipes, so you don't have to worry about that because it's heated to a certain level. Well, I still have heat in the home. Okay. Yeah. Um, I was in England when I was in my early 20s. I visited this guy that I met traveling, and I was in his home, and he, he was living with his parents, and his mom said, before you take a shower, um, you know, let me know 10 minutes before you take a shower, and I'll turn on the heat for you. And it occurred to me, gosh, in America, we have hot water 24-7, 365. We have hot water when we go on vacation. We have hot water all the time when we don't use it. What an amazing waste. Here we are in this world that's burning up, and we're using hot water that we don't even need, that we don't even use. Having said that, I don't know that you could do that with your systems. I have a tankless hot water system. Tankless hot water systems are generally good for one or two people. If you live with more than that, um, because you, you could only, it only gives you hot water to like one thing at a time. I'm not sure I could run my shower and dishwasher at the same time and have enough hot water for both. You could put in more than one tankless hot water system. So in other words, I don't have this big tank. If you need to turn on your, if you need hot water or whatever, once a day or twice a day in the morning and the evening, if you're running your dishwasher every day, I don't know if, if it would work with a hot water tank. I don't know if it would damage your system. So. If you were to try this, you need to check it out first. Maybe when you have your annual oil checkup um, or, or gas checkup, you could ask them whether you could do this. Now, with the tankless hot water system, I'm not heating up a big tank of oil, uh, of water, 
but I am, but, but there is like a little pot of water that's being, that, that, that is constantly heated. So that's why I turn the system totally off. So I'm not heating, so I'm not heating that either. So that water system, you know, had to continuously, has to continuously be at 120 degrees. And uh, so I, I, I shut it off. So um, I'm not, uh, I'm not heating that up either. When I'm away, I make sure my, my system is off. And by the way, I talk, so I talked to my oil technician about it, and he said, turn the system off, see if there's water collected, at the, you know, leave it off for the weekend, see if there's water at the bottom of my, of my boiler. He said, if there's not water at the bottom of your boiler, you could keep the system turned off. If there is water, he'd recommended uh, that I turn it on. There wasn't, so I, I, I turned it off. I set my water temperature so I have to turn the faucet up the whole way to the extreme position to have enough hot water for a shower. In most American homes, you turned up halfway and you'd scald yourself in the shower. If that's the case in your, your home, I would suggest you could turn your water temperature way down. I have a low flow shower head that I believe is about one gallon per minute, so I don't use a lot of hot water. I don't let hot water run when it's not being used, and I have a faucet aerator. Okay, using less electricity. This is the really easy one. You just buy renewable energy, and, and then your, your carbon dioxide output goes down to zero. So look at, uh, uh, for mass energy, I'm on the board of mass energy. We use easy energy, uh, but there, there are a number of different options you have, and if you purchase, uh, the, the cost isn't a lot more. It might add uh, uh, several percent, maybe 5% to your electricity bill. Um, I, replay, I had an old refrigerator. It used to cost me $14 a month to run. I replaced it with the most energy efficient refrigerator I could find, does the job just the same. And it only cost $4 a month to run. The numbers are, if, 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 your, if you bought your refrigerator before 1994, if your refrigerator is older than uh, a 1994 model, just replace it. You'll save money. Um, it, it, it's so expensive to run those. Um, if it was before 2004, you would also, you'd also reduce your energy use by a lot if you bought a new unit. It's because uh, our guidelines in this country um, get stricter by the year, and so there are requirements that, that refrigerators become more energy efficient uh, in 2004 and again in 2004. I converted all my light bulbs to fluorescent lights and LEDs. By the way, LEDs are the wave of the, the present, if not the wave of the future. Um, I work with hotels. Most of my hotels, if not all of them, have converted to LED lights. They're expensive. They're, pri they're, they're uh, still steeply coming down in price. Um, compared to fluorescence, they last about five times as long, so you'd have to buy five fluorescents for every one LED. Your LEDs will probably outlive you. Uh, uh, if there are any young people in the audience, maybe they won't. Um, but for uh, the rest of us, they'll probably outlive you. The light quality is superb, um, and the, uh, you could dim them uh, just about all the way down. Um, so, I, so consider looking into LEDs when you need replacements. Uh, the thing is, you, you need to make sure that you buy the one that you want because you, you're stuck with it for life. So make sure, it's, uh, it, make sure it, it, it looks just the way you want it to. I have an Energy Star computer and monitor. Um, those have, have saved, me, saved on my electricity usage. My TV is small, it's, it's, uh, and it's an Energy Star TV. I heat only the amount of water I need. So when friends are over um, they say, and they put on a, cup of, a pot of water for tea, they fill up the whole pot. And then they wonder why it takes so long for it to heat up. <laughs> I say, don't do that. Just, just you know, put the water in your cup, pour it in the teapot, the water will be done right away. You won't use so much energy. Um, I don't use air conditioning in my house. I work in my house in the summer. I have a fan trained on me. Um, and if I need to, I'll spritz myself or wear a, uh, you know, put a, a, a wet bandana on me, and that cools me off. I also have a ceiling fan if I, uh, if I need it. I, I never do, but if friends are over, I, I put on my ceiling fan. Um, part of this is psychological. Um, you know, we're used to in this country being very intolerant of being uh, away from 68 degrees. Um, and I think that, you know, we could really tolerate our 
All of our ancestors tolerated a greater range of, of temperature than we do. Um, and so I, I think we could get away from the notion that it has to be 60, 68 or 70 degrees at all time. And I'm pretty good about turning things off when I'm not using them. Gasoline, so how did I reduce my gasoline use? How could you reduce your gasoline use? Um, I changed my commute. I used to drive, my job was beyond Providence. Now I work mostly from home. Um, you know, I, when I took the job, I knew I was driving a long way. It was very important for my career that I take this job. But I had in mind that one way or the other, either I had to move or I had to change jobs eventually, and that's what I did. Um, weekend trips, I carpool more often. So my total car miles dropped from about 36,000 miles a year to 8,000 miles a year. And that's the most important thing that I did to reduce my carbon footprint. Um, for many of us, we can't right away just move. Uh, or we have households where one partner works here and another partner works there and the kids have to go to school here. Um, but I highly recommend that we think about for our next move or for our next job, how could we greatly reduce the amount of car miles that we travel? Again, there's no way of getting around it. If we want to reduce our carbon footprints uh, by 85% or very substantially, we have to reduce the number of miles that we drive one way or another, carpooling, mass transit, whatever you do. I used to drive a Toyota Prius and now I dr a Toyota Corolla and now I drive a Prius. Uh, that's been helpful. I hypermile. I'm a hypermiler, and I found that since I, I took uh, uh, since I, I, I uh, went to a, a talk on hypermiling and I went to the website and I started using the technique, the techniques, I've, re I've increased my miles per gallon by about 8%. So I used to get 46 miles to the gallon, now I, now I average 50 miles to the gallon. Thank yes, <laughs> Margaret. What's hypermiling? Hypermiling is using all the techniques to get the most miles per gallon possible. Um, making sure your tires are, are full would be one of them, coast to the stop sign, don't have jackrabbit starts. Here's one that most of these things you know about. Here's one that people might not think about. I didn't know about it. Let's say you're on the highway or in a hilly part of Medfield and there's not much traffic around. You want to go, you don't want to use, cruise control. you don't want to use cruise control. You want to go faster on the downhill and slower on the uphill. Think about, think about it as you're bicycling. You're bicycling on a hilly road. You're going down a hill where it's real easy to pedal. You want to go really fast at the bottom so you could get halfway up the next hill before you have to start pedaling. It's the same thing with cars. It's, they're both energy, either pedal power or gasoline. Um, you want to go faster on the downhill. You know, so you're going in a 55. You might want to hit 65 at the bottom of the hill and crest the hill at 50. Um, obviously, you want to be safe. Um, but. Um, but if, you're, if you are being safe, if, there's not, if there aren't a lot of cars around, if you have the lane to yourself, that, way would, that saves a lot of energy because the, 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 um, you use the most energy when you're going up hills. And um, if, you, if you're increasing your, your uh, speed up hills, you're really using a lot of gasoline. Um, on my handout, I, have a, um, I listed a uh, website where you could get 100 ideas about how to get more miles per gallon when you're driving. I, I check my uh, tires every time I fill up. I try to do it when it's cold um, because you won't get an accurate uh, measurement. But um, you know, I found I often need to, to fill up my tires. I fill up my tires to four pounds more than standard. You might want to do one or two pounds more than standard. In other words, if it calls for 35, um, you're going to start losing um, uh, as you drive, you're going to start losing pressure. So if you fill it to 35, A, it's going to be 34 at night anyway. And then as you go along, you drive. So, so consequently, most of the time, if you fill it to 35 and your car calls for 35, most of the time your pressures are going to be, your, your tire pressures are going to be too low. So that's why I fill mine a little bit higher than called for. So what's next? So these are all the things that have gotten me to a 78% reduction in my energy use. How am I going to get to 85%? Well, they're plug-in uh, cars now, uh, plug-in hybrids, where the first 10 or 40 miles are on electricity. They get the equivalent of about 100 miles per gallon. 
So when my Prius dies about six years from now, hopefully I'll be able to convince my uh, condo association to let me put an electric car charging station at my parking site, and then I will um, buy a plug-in Prius or a plug-in, another kind of plug-in car where I'll get about 100 miles per gallon. My boiler is a pretty good boiler. It's still running well, but it's 24 years old, and eventually it will die or become much less efficient, and when it does, I could buy a much more efficient unit. I will buy a much more efficient unit, and I might convert to natural gas, which would, which would be much more efficient. Um, what's the best strategy that I haven't used yet? Um, moving to a smaller home or getting a, a housemate in my house. Um, obviously, if, you get a house, if I got a housemate, I would cut my carbon by 50%. I'd probably have to do some things. I'd probably have to boost the temperature. I'd probably have to have hot water. But still, but still, um, I could boost my temperature to 75 degrees. If I had a housemate, I would, I would still come out better. Um, so this is a very important thing to do. Um, so if moving to a smaller place or getting more people in your home is uh, a great strategy for your, reducing your carbon footprint. It's really one of the reasons why America's foot, carbon footprint has expanded so much because we have fewer people living in our homes and we live further and further away from where we want to be. When I moved to my condo association in 1995, there were, I, I think there were like 18 people living there, and now there are about 12 people living there, you know, because family moved out, replaced by single people or couples. And, and so that's really had a big impact on the carbon footprint of our condo association. Now, the, the energy that we use at home and the energy that we use for transportation is not the whole story. We burn carbon in other ways. We burn carbon when we take airplane trips. And, and so it's important that we, we do carbon offsets for our airplane trips. So the company that I've been donating to to offset my airplane travel is a company that changes the incandescent light bulbs of poor people and puts in fluorescence. So they're using a lot less energy to offset the gasoline used for my airplane trips. I don't know if I could still use them. I might have to search for another carbon offset provider. A big part of our footprint has to do with what we eat. And the, the two worst things that we eat are red meat and cheese. They have the biggest impact. I hate to say that for vegetarians. Um, cheese is, is uh, next to red meat. It's, it, it has the biggest carbon footprint, in part because it takes 10 pounds of milk to make one pound of cheese. Um, this is true for all ruminants. Uh, excuse my French, ruminants belch and fart methane, and methane is a very potent greenhouse gas. That's why it's important that we reduce the amount of meat that we eat. Um, buying local is a good thing to do. It's, not a, it's probably not as important as people think. Um, the uh, Union of Car Concerned Scientists wrote this book that I recommend called Cooler Smarter. And they look at how could we live, how could we reduce our carbon footprint? And they looked at local food and they said, you know, it's not all that important. It only reduces the amount of, uh, the, the amount of carbon from our food by about 4%. But, you know, but 4% is still a good thing. Stuff, buy less stuff every time we buy clothes, every time we buy appliances, et cetera. It has a big carbon uh, impact. Reduce, reuse, recycle, and compost our garbage. I need to amend that. Buy recycled also. Buy recycled, uh, buy goods from recycled products. Reducing our use of fertilizers and pesticides is important because they emit nitrous oxide, which is a potent greenhouse gas. Do these changes save money? Hell yes. Um, <clears throat> I used to use 1,800, 18 gallons of, of oil a year. Now I use 400 at 375 a gallon. That's over $5,000 a year. Most of the changes that I listed were free, cheap, or had a very quick payback. There were only a few that had a, a payback, a poor paybacks, paybacks of, of over five years. Um, here are the projects that were not cost effective for me. I did them either to save money or for other, other reasons. We all buy things for other reasons. 
if I stuck with the Toyota Corolla rather than a Prius, I'd save money because the, the gas savings in the Prius is not going to make up for the extra, uh, the, the extra money. It's not going to make up the cost savings between the Prius and the Corolla. Um, the professional window restoration was expensive. And as I say, it didn't save me that much energy because I did a lot of weather stripping anyway. Um, my insulated uh, window shades were pretty expensive. I'll probably save about half of the amount of money that I spent on those. Um, and when I buy renewable electricity, it costs me maybe 5% more. But despite these things, I still save a ton of money from, from doing these things. Um, I was at a talk at the Newton Speaker Series uh, uh, last month, and somebody in the audience raised their hand and said, you know, it's really hard for us to, it's really hard for people these days. We're so stressed. We're working two jobs. We're doing all these things. It's really hard for us to save money. Uh, it's really hard for us to implement these, these uh, environmentally good things. Well, these things save money. If, you know, if we have stress in our life, if we, if we have uh, economic stress in our households, these are great things to do. Lessons learned. Um, so over the years of, 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 of doing, of taking these actions, this is what I learned. First, these are the most important things I did. The most important thing I did was reduce my commute. After that, air sealing and insulating my house uh, had a huge impact. Not heating water most of the time had a, had a, a big impact. Replacing my Corolla with a, with a Prius, uh, I probably, I set the temperature probably about five degrees lower now than when I moved into my house. For each degree lower you heat your house in the winter, you save about 3% on your energy bills. Buying renewable electricity is important, and uh, I eat close to zero red meat, and I use, eat a lot less cheese than I used to, so that's next most important. One of the best things I did was when I moved into the house, I started recording my bills. And so I know how much uh, uh, oil heat I used to use. I know how much electricity I used to use. I know how much gasoline I, I, I used to use. So I record that. It's a, it's a management axiom. What gets measured gets done. So I strongly encourage you to do that. Think outside the box, particularly for hot water. I'd never get to my goal of 85% if I didn't, if, if, I, if I couldn't figure out a way to greatly reduce the amount of energy I use for hot water. Another thing is energy saving technology is so much better than when I started this in 1995. It's so much better. Cars now, there were no cars that got 50 miles to the gallon in 1995 unless they were two seaters. Um, lights. Uh, we did have fluorescent lights back then. They didn't work as well, so fluorescent lights are much better. And now we have LEDs, and they're getting to be better and better than fluorescents. Appliances all use a lot less energy. We talked about uh, refrigerators. Um, boilers and furnaces are a lot more energy efficient than they used to be. The audits, the, first, the audits that I did back then were horrible. They're much better now. They still leave a lot to be desired. Uh, the, the insulation firms, uh, the, the firms that insulate your house and, and seal up the air, they still leave a lot to be desired, but they're so much better than they were back in 1995. Um, and solar energy is, is much cheaper. It's not a bad buy if you have the right roof and an unshaded roof right now, both solar for hot water and solar for electricity. And wind energy also has come substantially down in price. So you could buy renewable energy on your electricity bill, and it's just not that much more expensive. It's a little bit more expensive, but not much more expensive than it used to be. We are beginning to see a solar revolution, and it's going to pick up the pace in the, in the coming years because solar is, is, is a pretty reasonable buy now, and it's coming down in price so substantially, so quickly from what it was just a few years ago. Air sealing, as I've mentioned, you're never done air sealing your house. Um, often I get a question, could you air seal too much? Um, the answer is, yeah, theoretically, but for most houses you'll never get there. For my house, I'll never get there. Um, the companies that do the blower door test, they'll tell you how low you could go. In general, for the number of people you have in the house, you should have 300, square foot, 300 cubic feet per minute for every person in your house. I figure, well, you know, Beyond, four, beyond having three friends over, I could crack a window. So I don't want to get below 1,200. Also, if you seal it too tightly, you might have moisture problems. Um, but I guarantee that there's probably nobody has a house where you could air seal it, where you could possibly air seal it too tight. 
each year since 1995, I think, I've done just about everything. I can't go any lower. And as I think about it, I, you know, I keep finding ways. Uh, sometimes the technologies improve. Sometimes there are things I hadn't thought about before. Sometimes I go to a talk like this and I find something else or I read something. You will probably get to a, a point very quickly where you say, well, I've done everything. Keep thinking. Keep, keep looking for ideas. I keep finding more and more things that I could do. Um, the changes I've made haven't made me any less happy. Uh, they probably made me more happy. Some of the, you know, I, I have more money. Um, I've, I work from home instead of having a long commute. Um, what's that? You're cold. I'm cold 1% of the time, and that, that, that hasn't uh, impacted me too much. I'm not spending much time at gas stations anymore. I'm not always looking around for a gas station because I don't need them very much. Um, and because I have better air, uh, uh, insulation in my ceiling, I have fewer ice stamps. We could reach 85%. So if we want to have a hopeful future, we have to, we have to cut 85% or 90%. I don't know the exact number. I don't think anyone does. Um, we could change our... So we have to change our assumptions. We have to change our basic assumptions. If we're going to do this as a society and as a world, we have to change the I can'ts to I can's. That's the only way it's going to happen. I've heard them all. I use them all. You use them all. You're thinking right now, well, I can't do this because. Um, we have to change those. So I have a friend that said, I have to have a big car because I have a dog. Well, people had dogs before we had big cars. Um, I, had, I was talking to a, a Haitian friend the other day, and she said, I can't wear layers because, you know, I'm from Haiti, and it's just too uncomfortable to wear more than one layer in the house. It's like saying if I went to Haiti, I'd have, a, you know, I'd have on a, a thick shirt and a sweater, and I'd, be too, I'd say it's too hot around here, and I can't, take, I can't wear fewer layers because I'm from New England. Um, I used to say I, need, I have to use a clothes dryer. When, when people start saying, put your clothes on the line, I said, I ain't doing that. And a couple years later, I tried it. I don't have a line, but I, I hang them on hangers outside, and some I drape over my, my, my railings in, inside. And I found I could do this. It's better. My clothes last longer. Um, you know, I'd say, I, I'm not going to buy the Prius because it would cost too much money. Well, I eventually did. Or I'm not going to spend more money for renewable energy. I thought, I've, I need hot water 24-7, 365. Well, I changed that assumption. Every year I say, I can't turn my, the, the heat in my home down one more degree. And often I do. Sometimes I get a big bill uh, and, and I say, that's it. I'm wearing another layer and I'm turning it down one more degree. <laughs> so if we're going to get there, if we're going, you know, if we want to look at the young people that we, love, that we love in the eye and say, we've really tried, we have to change these I can'ts to I can. We have to figure out a way of doing this. What will you do to cut your fossil fuel use by 85%? Um, so questions, discussion, ideas. Margaret. I, I was unclear when you were talking about carbon offsets Okay, so let's say, so I travel to Cleveland a lot. My mother lives in Cleveland. And um, I, th I don't know if this is true. Somewhere I read, when you travel by plane, it's the equivalent of getting 25 miles per gallon. So going all the way to Cleveland and back uses a lot of energy, uses a lot of fuel. So I want to find a way to save that amount of fuel that I use for my airplanes. So I offset that amount of fuel by giving to a company that purchases fluorescent bulbs for poor people and changes out their incandescent bulbs. So they save the energy and that they save enough energy to offset my airplane rides. So you mean if you had driven your Prius out there, you would have saved? It would have been yeah, then I would have gotten 50 miles a gallon instead of 25 on my airplane flight. And don't quote me on that. I read it once. I'm not sure if it's true or not. The 25 miles per gallon figure. But use, we use a lot of energy on airplane flights. There's no getting around it. So I need to fly back and see my mother. Um, so I offset my carbon. And occasionally, I like to fly and take vacations. Um, though I do stay around New England more than I used to. Other thoughts, questions? Yes. I, I use my um, dryer just as an iron. 
I just put the clothes in until they're hot enough so that the wrinkles shake out, and then mm -hmm. I just shake the clothes out and hang them around. Okay, good idea. So it's a way of reducing your dryer use. What, uh, newer dryers have sensors, moisture sensors, so they shut off when clothes are dry. So that's another way of doing it. I think I've also read, and it's probably in my handout, uh, uh, dry towels at a different time than the rest of your clothes. I can't remember why that is. But uh, yeah, finding ways to reduce. And um, you know, as I say, I used to think there's no way that I would stop using a clothes dryer. Now I, I use it very occasionally when, um, uh, you know, if I have to have something uh, that night. Um, but probably nine times out of ten, I, I, I don't use a dryer anymore. And it's much better for your clothes to not use a dryer. Yes? I have an idea. We had a woman that told us that this worked great. She never turned her air conditioning on. She uh, put jugs, milk bottles of water in the freezer. I know her. Okay. <laughs> and it's in my handout. Okay. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. I got the same idea from her. Just a minute. <laughs> she she would put the fan in the window in front of, and then the milk jug in front of it with water in it, and just with blow, ice, with yeah. ice water, yeah, ice, in ice, it, and just blow the the uh, fan over that. And she said the room was really cold. She actually yeah. had to put a blanket on at night. So about five times a year. So I don't have air conditioning in my house, as I said. And at night I have a fan trained on me, and usually that's good enough. But about five nights a year where it's just too hot and I don't sleep well. So I fill up two gallons of water, put them in my freezer, they're frozen, put a, you know, and at night I have a fan blowing on them and then it goes to me. It's, it's air conditioning. And so instead of buying an air conditioner and running it a lot, that is my air conditioner. It's not terribly energy efficient, but I only use it five times a year, so five nights a year. So it, it becomes a, a very good way to um, do it. By the way, when we buy things, there's a lot of energy embedded in it. So when you buy an air conditioner, you know, steel was mined. That ore was transported. It was shaped into steel. It was transported again. So you don't have, so if you use this solution, you don't have all that embedded energy in your air conditioner. Instead, you just use, use it uh, uh, on occasion in, in the hottest days of the year. Uh, oh, Ellen. Oh, I can't tell if somebody else had a question too. I, um, I just wanted to let people know also that we do have um, Anna Mae here. She's done um, geothermal, um, converted her house to geothermal energy. So if anybody has any questions. Mm -hmm. And then also Chief Meany has done the solar panels on your home, correct? Okay. So Years. if anybody else um, has questions about that, I just wanted to let people know. So. Would either of you like to talk for a minute about it? Would you like to speak for a minute about your experience? We've been at the same meetings now. We've been oh. <laughs> You've heard it already. OK. Um. So we converted to geothermal about, um, this is our first winter using it. And I would say we should have probably converted to gas. Um, it's just for AC purposes, it's brilliant, it's wonderful, beautiful, but our house is big and I just, if someone else knows a geothermal company out there, we need a second opinion. So I don't know if this is really the best place for geothermal. I think maybe down south huh. it's, a, it's a better fit, but it gets, so it can get really cold here and then it freezes up because the G, we have 6,000 feet of pipe, six feet under the ground. And, um, but when it gets really cold, those freeze up and we don't have heat in our house. So we're dealing with a lot of issues. So I, I would investigate more. We need to investigate more. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, yeah, so I, I really wish it was the solution. How is it both lessons learned? It, it's like the eight, your, your um, refrigerator. It converts, you know, the, it takes the heat out of the water. It takes the heat from the earth into a machine and then extracts the heat and pushes it through the house. I think. Yeah, that's it, true. Yes, okay. It's hard to understand but when if you're not very, an engineer. I don't get it. But, yes, but that's, that's but the that's general what, that's concept. What, that it's easy to understand how it cools because it's always 55 degrees down deep. And so you're bringing that 55 degrees into your house. But you, you can extract that heat and, and uh, bring it into your house also. Well, see, that's what I thought it did. It took, instead of trying to heat your house from 
17 degrees that might be outside, you're starting at like 55. So I thought that was the savings. You're heating from 55, which is the Earth's temperature that's coming up, to like 65. Right, right. Is that not how it works? Do, do we have an engineer here? Mm -hmm. That's how it works. That's how it works. Yes, <laughs> yes. But it's just, it, for our home, we live in, a, in an antique. It's just not the best system, unfortunately, and I really wish it were. Oh, wow. so, so we have to now look up and look for a backup system. Thanks to, for that testing will, this for the rest yeah, of us. Yeah. <laughs> Fifty thousand dollars later. <laughs> Sorry. Other other brilliant things you guys have done. How, how, oh. You can't talk about solar for a minute. I uh, I didn't exactly plan to come here, wearing the uniform tonight. I was hoping to eliminate this part of it, but but it just it, it just didn't work out that way. Um, so anyway, we. Uh, my wife and I put, uh, any of you know, I live down across, kind of like across from Shaw's. Um, ranch house sits back off the road. We, uh, we had the piece of property, so I was able to do a ranch house. Uh, it was built in a factory up in New Hampshire, so it was tight as a drum. Uh, transported down on two trailers and popped up in a day and a half. Uh, when we put it up, I had um, piping going from the basement to the attic, knowing that we are going to do solar hot water. So a year later, 1984, we did that. We put um, domestic solar panels on the roof, three of them, and they, they work very well. And the other thing we have on the front of our house, also facing south, is a um, 12 by 18 foot sunroom, which right now, this time of day, with it dark, the door is closed. But on a, when it gets warm in the, in the winter, if we have a sunny day in the winter, it's bumping 100 degrees out there, and that heat just comes in the house. And the big joke, when my kids were younger, and I spent a quarter of a century working over in Wellesley, um, and most of it in the middle of the night, I'd come home, and, you know, the kids want to see Dad, but, you know, got to sleep sometime. So they'd shut the bedroom door, and my wife would lock me in so the kids couldn't get in and bug me. And every now and then she'd forget, and she'd leave me locked in, and I had a little piece of paper so I could slip it in case I wanted to get up. <laughs> um, but the house, because of the solar room, would be 60, 65, 70, the rest of the house just fine. And I, I'd be like, I, I'd be at your, your temperature. And I'd wake up at 3 in the afternoon, I'm like frozen. Um, so, but the house would heat up great just from the passive solar coming in the front. And the panels on the roof, there were, uh, you know, myself and my wife and my son and my daughter, they're long, you know, headed out on their own. Um, what it does is, again, you go back to that 55 degree thing. The water comes off the street about 55 degrees. This time of year, on a, even a cloudy day, um, the solar panels will kick on, and they'll get that water to 90 degrees. So, in, you know, so I'm getting from 55 to 90 out of the panels, and then I go 90 to 110, 115, 120 off of the furnace. Um, and then during the summer, we could pretty well shut it off partway through May, shut the furnace off partway through May, turn it on. Um, sometime partway through September because we didn't need it for heat, so we shut the furnace off Why well, have it on. And we could go like even a couple of cloudy days and you know what kids are like taking showers and we'd, we'd be okay. There was a 100 and, uh, 130 gallon water tank in the basement that would heat up. It looked just like a still. You know, I, I probably could have, if I was down in the Ozarks and you know, moonshine is on the Discovery <laughs> Channel, I, I'd probably be in business. Um, so it worked fine. So the, uh, about three years ago, um, the, the tank down there was starting to spring a few leaks and rather have 130 gallons of water all around my basement someday. I decided, okay, you know, let's, let's see about replacing it. So the tax incentives were at, at the right time. So we, we replaced that, and then while the person was there, I said, okay, what about photovoltaic? Taking the, you know, collecting electricity. And when we looked at that back in the 80s, you'd have to take the electricity off the roof and put it in the big deep cycle marine storage batteries. And all I could think of is the World War II submarine movies, you know, the depth charge, the batteries would start to leak, they'd have to surface, and then, then it wasn't good. So I'm like, I'm not going to have those batteries in my basement with my kids running around and all that stuff. So scrap that, didn't do that. We did it this time because now what happens is I've got, I think, 27 panels up on my roof. The electricity goes back to NSTAR. And here in Massachusetts, they've got to take it from me. So my meter actually runs backwards, um, so which is a neat thing. So last year, for the 365 days, um, I think our 
you know, between our credits and, and what we use, we paid $120 for electricity for a year. So it worked out well. And I'll tell you, I, I, I completely understand the milk jugs, and I've, I've actually seen that work. But I have a whole house air conditioner. But realize it's a one-story ranch house, so it's not that big. So that's even, you know, running the AC. Um, so, it, it, so that works really well for us. And, the, you know, the domestic uh, solar is still working just fine. Um, I'll tell you, but now there's an upfront cost of this because um, there were tax, um, uh, there were um, interest-free loans to do this, but I probably, uh, we probably put out about $35,000 to do this. Now, if I get 60% of my electricity off the roof, that'll be paid back in 13 years, so I got about another 10 years to go. But we're getting much more than that off, and then we're, we're vicious about shutting off lights. We had NSTAR come in, change all of our light bulbs, you know, if I'm, it, in the morning, you know, the, the light goes on in the bedroom, and then it goes off, and the hallway light goes on, and then it goes off, and the light... And the, so we just kind of like do well. It, you can see where we're walking by the lights going on and off. But we just, you know, like, like yeah, you, we just, you just think about touch. things. <laughs> yes, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, yeah. Um, so we just try to think about it and incorporate it. So, you, you know, why do you have the bedroom light on, at, you know, from 7 to 10 at night when you're sitting somewhere else on the other end of the house, you know, watching television? So, you know, we, we do a few things like that. And, uh, you know, you put it all together. And the other thing, too, is we probably use about, um, I, have, uh, I have an oil furnace, and we probably use about two tanks of oil a year. Um, you know, and so, we, we, so we're doing pretty good. But I had the advantage of being able to face that house the way I wanted to face it. And I think I even went a little bit overboard because I think solar south is just a hair towards the west from true south. Um, and so we, we did that too. So I, I took advantage of it, and it's lengthwise, so it gets lots of heat and whatnot. So how often do you have to replace the panel? Well, we didn't. Um, the I really didn't have to replace those domestic panels after the because we replaced them at like twenty. They've been up there twenty six years, and they were still okay. But while we we're replacing the whole system, there were newer ones, much more efficient and whatnot. So we decided to replace them. So. You know, the panels we had up there were still okay mm -hmm. at the end of a quarter of a century. Uh, and the photovoltaic panels, I truly do not know how long they will last. The other thing you have to think about, though, when you do that is if you're going to do that, you make sure your roof is in good condition because you don't want to put all the stuff on there and then two years later, oh, yeah, I need a new roof, I need new shingles, yeah. and then you take it all off, replace the shingles. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we thought about that ahead of time and figured that out and did that. And, you know, the solar panels provide a layer of protection for the, uh, for the shingles, too. Now, I'm going to be totally honest with you and tell you that this winter has been pretty good. Last winter was stunning. The winter before, uh, the, uh, the solar panels uh, didn't see the light of sunshine for, like, two months <laughs> because they were buried under the snow. And I did ask the company, okay, I, I really want to save electricity. Should I go up there and, you know, get one of those snow rakes and scrape the panels off? They're like, for the amount of energy you're going to save, don't be going up there and scratching up those panels and fouling things up because we'll be out there replacing your panels. So, like, so just take a chill pill, relax, <laughs> let Mother Nature do some melting, and, you know, don't break it. So that's what we did. So we, we've had a really good experience, um, you know, with it. The other thing about the, the solar room in the front is that there's a concrete foundation. It's filled with uh, rocks and gravel, it's like a heat sink. So even on a cold day in January when it's been 10 degrees outside, it's been in the upper 90s in there, and even at 10 o'clock at night, you can go waltz out there, and that, it's still warm because it's soaked up all the heat. Um, so, you know, we, we did a few things like that. So. so what are the ones called, again, that take in the energy? And photovoltaic. So there are two kinds of electricity. Uh, photovoltaic, which is a, two kinds of solar. Photovoltaic for electricity and th and thermal for thank you that was great. Uh, <clears throat> solar thermal is hot water. So, so solar thermal is heating up things, heating up mass. Um, <clears throat> solar panels. I talked to a solar uh, salesperson today, and he said expect about 20 years of your panels. I've heard 20 years. I've I've heard 25 years, and perhaps they just slowly degrade. So it doesn't mean that. They'll be totally useless after that time. Other things that people have done that have been great ideas for you, that have really worked well for you. Well, I, 
uh, do keep track of my energy consumption. And you know, on your gas bill, it'll show you. <coughs> oh, that N star, that, that colorful chart that N star sends you to compare how much electricity <coughs> you use compared to your neighbors. Well, there's that. There is that. Yeah, one. yeah. Yeah. I don't like that one so much. Yeah. I yeah. Like I know. That one's like, properly. whoa. <laughs> um, but when you, like, if you just get your gas bill, you can see this January and last January. But you really need to keep track of it on a different piece of paper so you can watch a whole trend, right? Because sometimes the month is 28 days, sometimes it's 31 days. So if you're really going to do that, you know, just start checking off. And you'll see when you start to put these things in, all of a sudden you're looking at this January, last January, and you will see improvement. Yeah, what gets measured gets done. It's a real motivator, uh, I find. Yeah, well, th those NSTAR charts are motivating, too, yeah. you know, that they send out to, to everybody. Yeah. Other ideas people have used that... Uh, yes, you can go to the uh, NSTAR website and uh, adjust your information about your home, whether it's a heated basement or something like that, that they're not comparing. No, I, I did try it once, but I will try again. So. I'm still not happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> <so. laughs> well, I have a question, too. Sure. Um, you have gone to so much effort over 10 years mm -hmm. to reduce your fossil fuel use by 85%. Mm -hmm. And you're, I think you said we all need to do this. <laughs> yeah, he did. <laughs> I, I hate to be Debbie Downer. No, please, <laughs> please. Like, what are, what are we to do? Really? Because I, I don't know what we're going to do. Because I don't think everybody's going to do what you have done yeah. on a nationwide level when we have you know, so much else to That's the conundrum that we're in. Um, it would be great if we could bargain with the laws of physics. It would be great if we could say, you know, we're really trying. Could you, could you buy us another 10 years? But the laws of physics don't negotiate. And the best and brightest scientists say, hey, we have to cut by 80% as a world by 2050. And a lot of it soon. If or we're going to blow way past 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 Fahrenheit. And beyond that, this, the circumstances are going to be dire. Um, we see everything the scientists have said since the 80s about climate change has come true. They said the Earth's going to warm, it has. They said that sea levels are going to rise, they have. They said storms are going to get worse, they have. They said we're going to experience more drought. That's happened. We've had unexpected changes. We didn't know that if, if the, uh, uh, the western states, the temperature rises by uh, a degree or two, that means that beetles are going to live, uh, outlive the winters, and they're going to devastate forests. You know, so there are all these unintended consequences beyond the things that we could predict. And we've gone up one and a half degrees. When we go beyond 3.6 degrees, scientists say, well, then it really becomes dicey. Are we going to be able to grow enough food for ourselves if we continue to have droughts and floods? Are we going to have to relocate tens of millions, hundreds of people, millions of people like us who live near the coasts? It, what's it going to do to the economies of our coastal cities and our countries that depend on our coastal cities? The consequences are real dire. So you raise a good question. How could we possibly do that? And that's the challenge that we have. And um, I'm not an optimist, but we ought to try. So I work in renewable energy, mm -hmm. among, among other things. And so I want to just raise a point, um, just echoing Megan's point about what can you do. You're not, mm -hmm. not going to do 85% maybe mm -hmm. yet, but you can do something. Um, exactly, the good exactly. News is that renewable energy companies like mine, you, there's other products. You're probably talking about 100% renewable, which you can get, which is, you're right, about 5% more. But companies like mine can offer 20% increase in renewable, and it's 5% less over time. So and your company is? Meridian. Okay. So you can, in other words, it, it can actually be less than the base rate of utility it, over time. If you have a good roof now, you could get power purchasing agreements. So you don't, you put up the panels, a company puts up the panels on your roof, you don't own them, they own them, and they sell you back the electricity at less than you would pay otherwise. You know, that's just for electricity. We have even bigger problems with heating our homes and with transportation. It's a guy in Newton, I met him a couple days ago. He said, we have two cars in my household, the Prius, which is my gas guzzler, and my, my Leaf, which runs on sunshine. So he has a new, Nissan Leaf. It's an electric car. He has big solar panels on his house in, in uh, Newton. 
and it powers not only the electricity from his home, but it also powers the car. And the car, I think they could get 80 miles per charge. So that car does not use gasoline. At, sorry, at night, so how does it power, if, you, if you're presumably somewhere else during the day, let's say, and you're charging it at night, how does that work with the solar? I mean, it's, it's great. Well, you know, let's say that, you know, he's on the grid. So his meter runs backwards dur during the day, and at night he draws electricity, but the net is zero or something like that. Um, so they're great solutions. Yes? Yeah, to, to your point, I think that's why it's, there's not a strategy. There are all kinds of strategies. <laughs> right. Think, you know, you have talked a lot about what you did to reduce energy. Yes. With very little cost, actually. Now, I was at a conference on Sunday, and we talked about the legislative things that are happening that are, number one, closing the coal burning plants, particularly in New England, because of regulatory problems and because natural gas has become cheaper. So that has a very strong effect on carbon uh, footprint of the, of, the, of the global thing. The other is, to your point, about the lower cost of, of, of photovoltaic. Even here, we in Medfield are looking at the town putting photovoltaic at the wastewater treatment plant, just as a way of reducing uh, the carbon footprint of the town for the town. And individuals can do that too. You can put your own photovoltaic in, uh, and that re you can live like a queen, you know. Run your house at 65 degrees right, in right. the summer, 85 <laughs> degrees in the winter if you want to, if you generate enough electricity off your own roof. If you have solar panels on your roof, solar thermal panels on your roof, you don't have to have cold water all year. You can have hot water all year. Yeah, so um, you have to dress like that's right. <laughs> yeah, right. There are homes in Massachusetts, if, you, if you're going to build a new home, there are homes in Massachusetts right now that are zero energy homes. You don't have to pay to heat them. You don't have to pay for electricity. You don't have to pay for hot water. Yeah, there might be, in the winter, maybe you draw some electricity. In the summer, you give it back to the grid. Um, so the, the capabilities are enormous. It's, I think the biggest issue is our will. We have to decide this is, this is a, a problem that we have to focus on, um, like a laser beam. This has to be our Manhattan Project. Uh, if it is, well, maybe we could get there. Maybe not. Um, but if it's not, we're not going to get there. And, and the consequences are, 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 truly, are, are truly difficult. I mean, the water outside, of, you know, when sea levels are three to six feet higher by the end of the century or, you know, in the coming decades, it's not going to take a Hurricane Sandy to flood a good part of Boston. That should focus our minds. You know, we should think, how are we going to deal with, you know, we, we, we need to really uh, uh, take charge of our situation or things are just going to get, or things will get a lot worse. So I just wanted to make a, a point that you were talking about, about, you know, how we can personally do it in our homes and you work in your home, but a lot of us don't work in our home and we can make these same kind of changes in our workplace and really be advocates right. for sustainability in our, in our offices or wherever else we can. I happen, that's a great point, and I happen to believe that if we're going to solve this problem, it comes from doing it in our homes. Because when we do it in our homes, then we don't tolerate so much in our workplaces. We know the solutions in our workplaces. We started recycling, and then we go to work and we say, hey, put in some recycling bins. Um, same thing with energy. Um, and, and you could say, you know, could I work from home every once in a while? Um, so I don't have to drive so much. Um, I believe it starts in our home. Then we tell our, our businesses, our government, um, that you know, we, we'd, like to, we'd like to create the kinds of changes that we're doing in our homes. Um, that's just my opinion. Uh, you know, a lot of people you know, say, it's the government, it's business, and it is. Um, but it's also us. It's everybody. It's everywhere. Uh, another way of looking at it is, once I started trying to reduce my energy use, and once they start doing it in hotels and businesses, there are opportunities everywhere. We're such a wasteful society. We're a society built on cheap energy. 
you know, as I, as I mentioned, the, the, the people I, I stayed with in, in England, they said, when, you're, when you want a hot shower, tell me 10 minutes before and we'll turn on the, the hot water. They, even have ener they, they didn't have uh, hot water 24-7, 365. There are opportunities everywhere. Uh, it, it, you know, so as we look, and I'm sure this crowd does look for them already, but as you do more things, you'll see more opportunities. Other ideas and uh, any, any? I just had a question on the hotel. Um, I saw a trend. I was at a meeting in South America, and um, I was in my room, and the power went out. I mean, it just went off. Yeah. And you're like, well, what's going on? And they're, 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 they're reducing their carbon the footprint. Card, your room key, slide it through. Yeah. Lights come back on. So yeah. It's really. Are you seeing that? I mean, again, Absolutely. Are you seeing that? N not that same system in this country, but there are other systems. So when our uh, Medfield policeman said that um, as he walks through the house, the lights go on and off, you always know where he is. <laughs> um, there are those systems in, in hotels too. So one of the main things we do when we're reducing our energy use is reduce the waste, not use energy where we don't need it. And so um, in a hotel room, there are sensors uh, in many hotel rooms, maybe a third of hotel rooms, you walk into the hotel room and, uh, and uh, it senses that. It raises the temperature to, or lowers the temperature to, to, to baseline. I should put it the other way around. You leave the hotel room, the temperature goes back to baseline, the lights go off. In an advanced system, the drapes close, the TV goes off, um, and maybe there's even an alarm that says, hey, that, that guest left the shower running and they left the room. Um, which is not uncommon. Um, so yes, there are great sensing systems that are available in hotels, and I work with my hotels on that often. Um, Can you replace fluorescent lights in a business now with, with LED? Is, it, is that expensive? Absolutely, and no. Um, it's cost effective. Now, the tubes, fluorescent lights are still there isn't an, a good LED solution for tubes. It, probably in a few years there will be. But for most, you know, for, for tubes up here, these are the fluorescents are the best solution. For most other kind of lightings, LEDs are. And imagine you're in a hotel, and in a huge hotel, the Sheraton Boston, 120 rooms. Even with fluorescents, lights are going off all, lights are burning out all the time. So you have workers running around changing the light bulbs. The, um, uh, on the, the, the Weston Copley place, you walk in and there's a big escalator. And every time those lights went out, you'd have to, they'd have to stop the elevator, get, put, have three people to put up scaffolding to change a light bulb. So at the time, a few years ago, they said, we, we have to have incandescence. That's the Weston standard. Well, the director of engineering and the general manager said, let, him ca let Weston catch us. We're going to change those darn things. We're going to put in... Um, uh, LEDs that will last even even if they're on 24 hours a day the last five years so we don't have to go through this anymore so they they save money on electricity they save money on labor as well and they save money on disposal they're, they're screwing like that versus fluorescent it, it, the, mean, tubes they're screwing they're small versus tubes well, well they're LEDs for just about everything what I'm saying is for tube technology, fluorescent technology is still better than LEDs. For most other kinds of technology, LEDs are now better than fluorescents. They cost more, but they last f three to five times as long. They dim better, they look better, the color rendering is better, etc. cetera. And, and lighting is going to continue, LED lights are going to continue to get a lot better over the next few years and a lot cheaper over the next few years. Sort of like computers. Any other questions? Nope. Well, thank you very much, Dan. That You're was welcome, very Helen. informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Change all of our thinking that I can't, I can't, to I can, I can. And like you said, whatever we can do, you know, like our motto with Medfield Green is, you know, we're all different shades of green. Whatever you can do is better than nothing. Um, I wanted to make sure everybody got the handout for those of you who did come in later. And then um, Dan.
Ann's um, contact information, I think, is on the bottom there. Yeah, just, I mean, for people to just kind of hear about what you have done, even if it, some of it is a little extreme. <laughs> I want to be provocative. I do think so. <laughs> Crazy. <thank you. laughs> crazy. I didn't say crazy. Oh. You said crazy. I didn't say crazy. <laughs> but thank you very much for coming, everybody, and uh, we'll see you at the next event. This program was made possible through the generous support of your Medfield friends and neighbors, folks just like you. And thanks for watching.